then I'll, I'll go a bit uh, quickly, but uh, it's, it's, what I'm doing is a quite simplistic approach to see if whether we can find um, an index that can help us uh, not only say if a growth was pro poor, but by how much. And first off, um, I base my approach on a relative approach to pro poor growth, because here we've been discussing inclusiveness, and I think my, the, the speakers before were talking about a relative approach to inclusiveness, whereby the poor benefit disproportionately more than the non-poor, and I think this is, this is important to, um, to mention. So the, the increasingly recognition of inequality within the development uh, discourse, I will not go through it because I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure all of you are, are well aware. Uh, for me, it's important to see that inequality is not anymore something that leftists and red people would only defend, but it's something that now it's mainstream because of the negative effects it can have on growth, spells, length, and, and, and poverty reduction rates and so um, When it comes to the terminology, proper growth... Uh, it, this is evolving. I, I wrote this a couple of years ago. I was doing other things in between, and in between, pro-poor uh, pro growth has stopped being fashionable. Now it's inclusive growth. Yeah. So um, what I'll try to focus is on a very uh, narrow uh, definition, which is uh, mainly on, on the pro growth concept. There have been two main approaches. One is the absolute one that uh, Ravalian, for instance, used to defend. I don't know what he thinks now, but uh, whereby... Any growth that reduces poverty is pro-poor. While what I'm claiming, together with much more famous people than me, is that uh, it should be called pro-poor if and only if the, the poor grow faster than the non-poor. And that will be the relative approach. And uh, I think this is, this is a, this is a no-brainer, actually, because if, if, if a grow in which the non-poor benefited more than the poor, then you could also call it a, a pro-non-poor growth. <laughs> it would be the same definition that pro-poor growth, which, okay, it's absurd. So I will focus on the uh, relative approach, and that means that what I'm looking at is a, at, at a growth in which the poor benefited uh, more disproportionately from growth, and then using a sharply decomposition, we can look at any change in poverty uh, we can look at the growth component or the distribution or redistributional component. That means any change in, in, a poverty, measure, in, in poverty, you can attribute it to whether everybody, the mean income went up or whether the distribution of income changed in favor of the poor. So this is uh, generalized by Shorrock and from the Shapley composition. And then I, look at, I, I first look at what there was available in terms of poorness and there are several methodologies. Many of them are, are based on uh, graphic uh, methodologies, like the one we've seen on the growth incidence curve. I think that's very useful, but that doesn't give you a measure of by how much that pro poor is. Or you may have an incidence curve that is uh, slightly uh, progressive or slightly regressive, or, or, or that it does not allow you, or that there is not a clear dominance on, on, on the previous situation in which you wouldn't be able, actually, in many cases, to say if that was pro poor or it wasn't. So, um, when it comes to indices that you can actually measure, so far in the literature that I know, at least, Kakwani and Pernius and Son uh, have an index that is the, I call it the Kakwani index. But um, I, I, I did a consultancy for Honduras. I tried to apply this index uh, to, to, to find out. And then I realized that, in fact, well, they have two definitions. Yeah? The first one, when the uh, per capita growth is positive. Second one, when per capita growth is negative. That means, first, that you have var values that may not be comparable because these are two different formulas. Then you have that when changes in poverty due to growth are close to zero, which sometimes happens, especially if you have uh, populational growth and economic growth that are the same, then the, the mean income may not have increased, actually. In that case, that shoots up to infinity. In the case of, per cap on, of negative per capita growth, you would have that if you have that these two are equal, but if the different sign again, you have infinity. So how do you compare an index with itself when, when you have actually asymptotes in between? Yeah? And, and in values that are, uh, in principle, uh, quite that, that, that they can occur quite often. So what I looked at um, is instead of getting a formula in which you have a division, yeah, I tried many different formulas, yeah, and at the end I thought that the, the easiest one was, okay, if we are looking at, uh, at how poverty changed because of distributional issues, then we could actually just take 
the distributional component of changes in poverty. And that, what that tells you is how much poverty changed due to the changes in the distribution in favor of the poor. And I think it's a pretty simplistic uh, definition, and, and it actually works. What I wanted to know is, um, well, okay, then does this apply to any poverty measure? So can I take the decomposition in any poverty measure, and that will tell me always, um, would measure in a good degree if the poor benefited more than the non-poor? The answer is no. I, I took the headcount index, and, and, and actually you can think of... Um, a change, an increase, a general increase in the income in which no poor passed over the poverty line, headcount is unaffected, yeah? And then you wouldn't, this wouldn't show, yeah? And um, I, I, I see that for this case of the headcount index, uh, you could have actual distributional changes that would clearly affect poverty, but it wouldn't show in the headcount index. So what I did is I applied it to the poverty gap and in fact, I was quite lucky to find that I, I wanted to see if, if these distributional changes in the, in, the, in the poverty gap would actually be related to the growth rate of the poor and that of the non-poor. Yeah? Although you there have a problem because in, the, in, the, in time one, you have a group of poor. In time two, you have a different group of poor. So which one do you take? And that's, that's why I avoid taking the group at the beginning or the group at the end. By doing the decomposition and for the case in which the number of people in society and the number of poor don't change, uh, then, then I can prove that this distributional component of changes in the poverty gap is proportional to the difference in per capita income of the whole society and that of the poor alone. So what I'm saying with this is, is actually the definition that this index actually is really directly related to the growth difference between the poor and the non-poor. But without being strictly that, because then you have an identification, uh, you have problems of anonymity. If you look at the poor at the beginning and the poor at the end, they may not be the same. No? So, then, then everything that follows is straightforward, yeah? depending on whether the, the, if the index, which is the changes in the poverty gap because of distribution, is Negative, that means that poverty gap decreases because of changes in the distribution, and that's a pro-poor growth or a pro-non-poor growth, because not everybody no, non-poor is rich. Yeah. So very often we say pro-rich. But... And then in the case of recession, what you could have is that distributional changes have favored the poor or the non-poor, even if it was a recession, or it's harmed the poor less or the non-poor less, and then I would call it an anti-poor or anti-non-poor. And from here, one could actually establish a proper growth rate, which could be the growth rate per capita, um, plus a factor of inequality aversion and so on, but that's always a bit funny to introduce. I think, I, I, I'd rather think of this as a standalone index that can tell you how much pro, how, how pro poor growth was during that period. Um, from here, one could, one could define some, some indices to evaluate, for instance, um, you could think of, uh, given the growth over the last period, how much pro-poorness or how much distributional changes would we have needed to achieve a certain poverty, go poverty gap reduction goal, yeah, like halving it or eliminating the poverty gap or so on. Meaning, I, I agree that uh, growth is a necessary condition but not sufficient to reduce poverty. And then uh, this, this at least I could tell you... Uh, how much effort you should be doing in the distributional side to contribute to poverty reduction. And the same, you could also do the same a bit uh, like as a, as a goal for the future, say by 2030 we want to reduce poverty to so much, counting on certain growth, then we would need so much changes in the poverty gap because of distribution. I'm not dealing on policies at all, yeah? so don't ask me on policies because if I knew that. Um, Okay, so here I applied the data to Honduras, and just so that you show, to show what one, one could get, um, getting the index at least, what I manage is uh, to classify each of the spells that I look at, and then see if in these spells distributional changes were in favor of the poor or not. And uh, in the case of Honduras, the, so for the moderate and extreme poverty lines, so you have that, it was anti-poor and anti-poor contractions, but you have... Uh, pro-non-poor, pro-non-poor. In fact, 
this is the only one that has progressive changes. Huh? And it's after, the, it's after the hurricane meat hit Honduras. So it's quite interesting. The hurricane hit, and in fact, the poor were less affected than the non-poor, which um, I don't know if that's very consistent, but that's, that's what I would like. Huh? <laughs> okay, it could be that uh, the, the, the rich lost more assets, no? I imagine, or at least more quantifiable monetary assets. And, um, and this is just to have a look at the, at the possible tools for evaluation. Um, we could see that this, the, the changes in distribution here were like 1.2% of what you would have needed to, to eliminate or to half the poverty gap. And here, that overall, over this period, 2004-2007, uh, the changes in distribution, the, the poverty gap changes because of distribution, were in the other way that they should have gone, and they were of a magnitude of 30% of what you would have needed to achieve the 2015 goal of halving the poverty gap. So why am, why am I claiming that this index is useful? I'm claiming that uh, it's easy to interpret. This is uh, distributional changes in the poverty gap. Any politician can understand that, but hopefully. Um, it does measure growth, it does, measure, it does measure how pro poor it is, and it's, uh, it's really related to, to a, a disproportional benefit for the poor. So at least I can claim that for this definition this uh, seems to work. So what I'm, what I'm doing now is calculate this for the whole world using income service, and hopefully in a few weeks or months I'll have this for all world countries and spells if possible. But uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks. Thank you.